The African catfish, which was domesticated for the first time around 1970 in the Central African Republic, has been extraordinarily successful in Asia, in Latin America, and even in Europe, where it's been introduced on account of the remarkable results obtained in fish farming. In Africa, where it's also highly valued, fish farming production remains limited to a few hundred tons. The failure to master the production of fingerlings has been an obstacle to its development. It is, however, quite easy by making use of local skills to ensure the regular production of catfish fingerlings, which ought to allow the production of this species to expand rapidly in its continent of origin. To obtain this objective, we're going to look at the way in which they're best bred, how the pituitaries and testes should be removed, how females should be injected, how eggs should be fertilized, and when and how larvae and fingerlings should be fed. The broodstock must be kept in ponds with a maximum density of one fish per square meter of water. They're fed daily with a mixture of agricultural byproducts, which may be dry or in the form of a damp paste containing 30 to 40 percent digestible proteins. When barely a year old and having attained a weight of more than 300 grams, the broodstock have as a rule reached maturity. Their sex is easily determined on account of the shape of the genital papilla. It's conical in the male and rounded in the female. The females are also selected on the basis of the roundness of the belly. This tells us that the ovaries are well developed. At a temperature of more than 23 degrees, artificial reproduction can be practiced the whole year round. The same female can spawn every six weeks. In the African catfish, the pituitaries can be removed from both males and females. However, males are preferred for this operation, as they will in any case be sacrificed for the removal of their testes. Care must be taken, however, to remove the pituitary from a male of a weight equivalent to that of the female to be injected. After the supplier has been killed, the head is cut off. The lower jaw is then separated from the rest of the head. In the middle of the dorsal part of the mouth, the palate is opened using secateurs. The pituitary is that small, white, opaque, globular organ which is clearly visible beneath the brain. It's removed by means of tweezers. It is placed in a mortar and crushed with a pestle. A few cubic centimeters of physiological serum are added and then everything is sucked up into a syringe. <laughs> The pituitary thus removed is injected into the dorsal muscle of the female selected. The female is then stored alone in a tank of water. At a temperature of 24 degrees Celsius, the final maturing of the ovaries takes place 12 hours after the injection. 
That's why, as a rule, the females are injected at the end of the day and removed the following morning. If there's a risk of the temperature dropping at night, the water can be reheated. The abdominal cavity of the male is opened from the anus. The digestive tube is then removed. The two testes are arranged on each side of the spinal column. Mature testes are recognized by their external white and opaque fringe. It's sufficient then to detach them from the dorsal part of the abdominal cavity with a view to using them directly to fertilize the eggs. The testes can be removed from the same breeder that provided us with the pituitary on condition they're stored overnight in a fridge. <laughs> The day after the injection, the female is removed from the tank in which she was stored. She's wrapped in a clean, dry cloth. If a firm and continuous pressure with the fingers is exerted along the length of the ovaries, a stream of eggs is forced out that are then collected in a small bowl. The ripe eggs are more or less transparent, quite small, and about 600 in number to the gram. When fully mature, a female can produce a quantity of eggs equal to 20% of her own weight. A female weighing a kilo can therefore produce 60,000 eggs. In order to fertilize the eggs collected with the sperm of the male, the testes are cut open. They're then squeezed to bring the milt in contact with the eggs. A volume of water equivalent to that of the eggs is then added in order to give mobility to the sperm so that they can then penetrate the eggs and fertilize them. We go on mixing everything for one minute, the survival life of the sperm. Then we move on to the incubation stage. On contact with the water, the fertilized eggs rapidly swell and become sticky. That's why they must be rapidly incubated. One technique consists in spreading the eggs in a simple layer on frameworks of mosquito net or on any fine mesh of less than one millimeter. These frames are then placed in a tank under a dozen centimeters of well aerated water. Another technique uses floating aquatic plants like water hyacinths or Nile cabbage. Their roots are soaked in the fertilization bowl and the eggs immediately come and stick to them. Subsequently, it's sufficient to place the plants in a recipient of well aerated water or in a hopper kept in a pond to ensure that the embryos develop well. With water at a temperature of 24 degrees Celsius and after about 30 hours, about 50% of the incubated eggs are hatched. To avoid water pollution caused by the rotting of the eggs that don't hatch, the frameworks of mesh or floating plants should be removed two days after they've been put in a tank. At birth, the larvae, weighing a milligram, perched on their betaline sac, fall to the bottom of the tank and make unsteady movements. After two or three days, the vitaline sac disappears and the larvae look for living food. 
They must be then fed two or three times a day with living zooplankton. This is collected from fertile ponds using a plankton net with a 100 micron mesh. Gradually, the plankton is concentrated into a container, then filtered using 50 millimeter mesh to keep out any insect that might prey on catfish larvae. This living mass of plankton can then be poured into the tank of catfish larvae, which rush about to get at the food. When they're about a week old, they're given a plankton complement. This consists of a fine powder of grains, less than 0.02 millimeters in size, made up of rice flour, wheat bran, and possibly fish flour. When they're two weeks old, the average weight is in the order of 100 milligrams. The hatchlings are then tipped into fingerling ponds, care being taken to sort out the biggest ones, which have the annoying tendency of eating up the smallest ones. With a surface of two to five airs and a maximum depth of one meter, the fingerling pond is surrounded by a mesh fence. This will stop frogs from getting in, which are major predators of hatchlings. After being first dried out, the pond is fertilized and then filled with water to allow the plankton to develop. A few days later, the catfish hatchlings are tipped in to the tune of 20 to 100 per cubic meter. They're now fed twice a day, still with rice or wheat bran and possibly with fish flour, but with grains below 0.5 millimeters in size. The amount distributed is in the order of half a kilo a day per air. This ration increases by 50% each week. After a month, the fingerlings that have reached a weight of around two grams are collected. They can then be sold to fish farmers to be reared over a period of around six months until they attain their commercial weight of around 300 grams. Given the differences in growth rate, it's better to fish out the biggest specimens. These eat the smallest fish, cannibalism thus considerably increasing the mortality rate. In poorly protected ponds, when the fingerlings are harvested, large numbers of tadpoles and frogs are found that damage fingerling production. Frogs consume large numbers. As for the tadpoles, they compete for the food that's provided. The artificial production of the African catfish is possible by employing simply local means. It's therefore pointless to buy pituitaries in Europe or the USA when attempting to breed them. The mastery of simple techniques should allow the production of the African catfish to be developed rapidly. The success of this undertaking at a local level will thus allow the aquaculture of this magnificent fish to soar in its country of origin. <laughs>